Today, we're heading back to the nurse homestead to talk to Katherine Bukowski. Katherine has been a member of the Danvers Alarm List for over 15 years, and she's currently the president and curator. She's going to meet us to give us a quick tour of the homestead. In future videos, we explore the house, the buildings, and the grounds in more detail. Today, I thought it would be fun to get an overview of the property, a bit of its history, and learn a little bit about what it was like to live in the house in 1692. Let's go see if we can find Catherine. Okay, we're here at the site. We're gonna go talk to Catherine Bukowski. Catherine is the current president and the curator. Well, she's the president of the Danvers Alarmist Company and curator of the uh, Rebecca Nurse Homestead. Uh, don't forget, please um, hit the subscribe button and, and like us. And don't forget to check us out on Patreon, patreon.com. It's patreon.com slash RNH for Rebecca Nurse Homestead. Let's go talk to Catherine. There you are, just hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, this is Catherine. Hi everyone. So why don't you uh, why don't you stop by just telling us a little bit about like you have about yourself like you have a degree in museum. Yeah, so I uh, have an undergrad degree in museum studies and history. I double majored. Um, my first job was actually working here at 14, so I got really interested in history and decided I wanted to pursue it professionally. I work for a historic organization um, in Essex County uh, for my full-time job, and so my whole life is really immersed in history. And, and you've been doing this for, because you, you, your father has been doing this since he's been 16, and he's in his um, 60s by now, right? So you've been, you've been yeah, involved I've been, in this. Since I was 14, and I'm 36 now, so I've been doing it most of my life at this point. Yeah. All right, can we go in and see? Sure, yeah, let's so. go in. We're actually going to enter through the back of the house. Most people think that this is the front because of the way it's facing to the driveway, but it actually is the back of the house, and typically they built their houses like this uh, with the majority of the, the roof facing the south, and that actually was better in the winter um, so that when it snowed and there was snow on the roof, it would melt pretty easily, and you wanted the least amount of your house facing the north wind for the winter, so nice. we are entering through the back um, through the garden section. Okay, perfect. Watch your head. Yeah. <laughs> so we're entering a, a part of the house that wasn't here originally during Rebecca's time. This was probably added on by her great-grandson sometime in the 1700s. And it's what we call our lean-to or our summer kitchen. Basically, as the temperature started to warm up in the colonies around here, they wanted to keep the heat out of the rest of the rooms of the house. So typically, you would have fires going in the main room and do all your chores. And as it got warmer, people didn't want to be in the main room doing the full cooking. So they would have the cooking done here in the summer kitchen. Uh, so we have lots of different tools that the people would have used for cooking and all sorts of housework. So it's kind of an amalgamation of stuff, but um, we can go into detail on some of these uh, later on some of the other videos that we have. Nice. All right. So this is our great hall, and this is typically the everything room. You're gonna notice we have all sorts of different tools in here for making clothing. It was also where people would cook the rest of the year. Our fireplace in here is quite large, and it's often a um, misconception that people would have huge fires going in here all the time. But really, uh, the fireplace is so large because you'd actually have little fires going on the sides as well, so you could cook separate items. Typically today, when you have a burners on your stove you have four sometimes people have six so you can cook multiple things and that was the same back then you could pull hot coals so you'd have a fire going in the middle and you pull the hot coals off to the side and then you could actually um, cook different things and not have to have everything you know going over that big pot 
We also have bake ovens in the back as well. Baking was maybe done once or twice a week depending on when you needed fresh bread, but you'd actually have a fire going into of those holes. When it really got hot, uh, the bricks would get nice and white, and so you'd pull all the remains of the fire out and quickly put whatever you're going to bake in there, and then cover it with the wooden plank like we have on the one on the right side. And that was how you would bake um, bread and sometimes pies, but it was time consuming to keep the fire going in there while also trying to keep an eye on what you have over here as well. We also have different uh, spinning wheels, one specifically for wool. Uh, so we have our wool wheel or our walking wheel. We also have a flax wheel over here as well. Lots of families were transitioning from making a lot of things out of wool into using flax for linen. Lots of families couldn't afford to keep a full barn of sheep, and so you didn't really have enough wool. You would actually start to supplement with uh, flax, like you have some flax there. And they started to create the first blend. They have Lindsay Woolsey, and it's a mixture of linen and wool, so that they had like little blend fabric. But so we have all the couturement for that. And in the corner, we also have a 17th century court cupboard. Uh, it was donated to us from a gentleman who had it in his basement. And it's an actual 17th century piece. There have been some replacements. He was a woodworker, so he was replacing things that had rotted over time. But it is an actual 17th century piece, one of the few uh, from the time period that we have in the house. A lot of the things we have in here are reproduction, mainly because the house was lived into right up until the 1900s. But it is cool to be able to have a court cupboard because as you see, this room is pretty bare. They didn't have lots of cabinets on the walls like we have today in our houses. Everything was put into chests or court cupboards and things. So you didn't have um, shelving built in like we have today. Okay. Let me open the door to get some light in here. I'm gonna head upstairs. And this is our hall chamber, our bedroom. Typically bedrooms like this were pretty bare. The family, if they used it as a bedroom, they only slept up here. This wasn't a place where you had a lot of stuff. Today you think about the stuff you have in your bedrooms. Lots of people keep lots of things, but this was very bare minimum. You had beds for the amount of people that needed to sleep here. So mother and father, all the kids, possibly extended family would all share one room. We have two different types of beds in here. All the beds at the time, used ropes instead of springs like you think of today. Most of our beds are made of springs or slats, but they use ropes. Their mattresses filled with hay. And in order to tighten the ropes, you'd use a bed key. You'd stick it in the slot here and turn it, and then someone would tie a tight knot on the other end. And that would keep the bed pretty comfortable. The other type of bed we have in here is a press bed. Now typically types of beds like this were used in downstairs rooms. They're kind of like the, you know, the olden day equivalent of a futon. So you'd pull it down when you needed it for nighttime and then push it up out of the way so that you could do things you needed to do in the downstairs rooms. We have it up here just to, to sort of fit it in with the bed chamber, but um, they're called press beds and they're similar even to like Murphy beds and things that people use as well. Very nice. Now, we don't know, so Rebecca was actually taken from the house right when she was arrested? Yes. But we don't know what room. I mean, we, don't we don't know. know. So we have, there's a couple theories. She could have been upstairs in the bedchamber. It was winter and she wasn't feeling particularly well. She was bedridden at the time. And I have a theory that she was likely in the downstairs rooms. A lot of families um, slept in the downstairs rooms in the winter because you needed to keep that fire going for cooking. Yeah. And so it would be very unlikely that they would start a whole new fire up here and waste all of that wood to have two fires going. And it also, a 72 year old woman trying to get her up the stairs when she stairs. wasn't feeling well, it might have made more sense for them to bring a bed similar to a press bed down, and then she would have been sleeping on that and they would have taken her from the chamber below. Why do you think they call it a press bed? I don't know, because you press it against uh -huh. the, <laughs> that's okay. my theory. <laughs> All right, cool, very nice, okay. Where else would you like to see? Uh, you, you show us. You want, to, you want to go back outside? You want to do the garden? Sure. Why don't we go 
go out the front so we can show the front of the house and show right. the difference. All right. So, when the house was originally um, built, it was actually the, the great hall and the hall chamber. And so the house actually ended where the doorway was. And then as the family got larger, they added multiple additions onto the house, adding a mirror image onto the side where the doorway is, and then other sections as well. The sundial on the front is kind of a, a funny story. So when the house was first being turned into a museum in the 1900s, the organization that was trying to turn it into a museum thought, who would want to see a house from the 1690s? Like Rebecca Nurse, like they didn't think that her story was going to be as important, but they thought one of the original owners of the property was Townsend Bishop. So you can see TB and 1636. So he was living here on the property in 1636, and the architect that was doing the work thought it'd be really cool to put a sundial on the front of the house. Unfortunately, it only works when the sun's over here, and then it's off when we do daylight savings time. And it's really impractical because people from that time period would have been able to come outside, look at where the sun's position was, and know what time it was. Yeah. It's a really fun story, but not authentic to um, Rebecca's time period at all. Interesting. And I know that there was some archaeological digs down, uh, right in front here, right? Yeah, so we did like a T-shape um, about 10 years ago now or so, and they found lots and lots of stuff from all the different centuries piled right on top. We actually have some of them on display in our green room, which nice. we can show you. Great. Okay. The green room? Yeah, let's do that. Turn the light on. Why do they call it the green room? Oh, because it's all painted green. We've literally, yeah, my whole life I've, we've called it the green room um, because the trim is green. But we have lots of different stuff from the archaeological digs. Some of the coolest stuff is going to be the stuff that's in this case here. Most of it's shards because it's really old. So we have a lot of prehistoric arrowheads, uh, Native American pieces, as well as the really cool piece here, which is a, um, a cord-wrapped piece of pottery, which would have been used by Native Americans. And we have 17th and 18th century pieces, um, different kinds of, we have uh, slipware and marbled slipware. So like what would have been nice bowls and plates and cups and mugs and things. But the really cool stuff also in here is um, we have lots of pipes, and the pipe stumps actually have teeth marks in them. Oh, wow. And they date back to the 17th and 18th century, so Rebecca or members of her family might actually be those teeth marks cool. that we see. So these were all found on the property. They were. And then we have all of what we get to call the modern-day trash. So before um, designated right. trash pickups in the later 1900s, when you had something that broke, you dug a trash pit and you threw everything in it. So we have tons of different kinds of medicine jars. Um, some of my favorites, we have a Bayer aspirin jar. You would, when it was empty, you go, you fill it back up, and then they started using plastic, so the, the glass bottles went out. But Vaseline jar as well. Uh, we had lots of sardine cans, and even we have a Heinz ketchup bottle. Uh, oh, cool. Very different than what we're used to seeing Heinz ketchup look like today. What's the date on that, do you know? Uh, we didn't date them, but most of the stuff in here is actually from between uh, 1784 and 1885, so probably on the later end of the 1880s. Because yeah, I was going to say Heinz probably was 1800s, right? Yeah. Cool. Yes, we have some cool I wonder stuff. if the archaeologists would have called it trash. Did they call it, did they call it trash? <laughs> they didn't, but, but basically that's what most that's of this is. stuff is. Came out of a trash heap. Yep. We've done lots of little digs all over other sites of the property, but the largest pit was out in front. That was pretty typical. When you anything broke, you just tossed it out the window or brought it out front instead of going all the way out to the wood line. We have done some digs, but haven't found really anything too substantial along the tree line. Most of the stuff was found in front of the house. Nice. Okay. You want to head out to the garden? Sure, I'll see the garden. All right. All right.
right? So most families would have had a garden at the back of their house similar to what we have. We kind of have a mixture of time periods here. Um, we've kind of gone back and forth and we're still thinking about how to reinterpret it. But most of what we have here on these herb beds are different herbs and things they would have used for medicinal purposes or spicing up foods. We have Egyptian onions here. You can basically eat the stalk, the bulbs, and the bulbs below. We've let them go like this so that we can have them replant next year. Um, but typically they would have also vegetables. We also have vegetables and things as well. Anything that families grew in the 17th century in their garden was for themselves. Anything that they grew in the large fields would usually be cash crops and things. So this was particularly for the family. And there's a great story about Rebecca um, having an argument with her neighbor about her garden. And some of the neighbors had pigs and the pigs actually ran over to her house and destroyed a lot of their garden. And she went over to the neighbor's house and had um, words with Sarah Holton's husband. And a number of years later when the witch trials came about, Sarah Holton brought up the argument because her husband had died a few months after Rebecca's argument. And she seemed to think that it was because Rebecca had cursed him. It could have just been any number of things, but she brought that back a year old, you know, years old argument um, over her garden. Huh. But I can understand why Rebecca would be upset because if the garden is sure. your food, yep. everything you grow here has to sustain you for the winter. For the winter so you have to yeah. grow a lot of stuff, keep a lot of your root vegetables in the cellar for the winter and cross your fingers and hope that it sustains you through the winter. Now I'll tell you, one, one of my favorites is the hops. I don't you know, <laughs> but uh, so I, did you know that we had these, um, or, uh, we had these uh, DNA tested? Yeah, so they were a 1940s brand something, or something. 1920s, 1940s, yeah. So it's not an old fashioned brand, but at some point, someone on the property in the, between the 1920s and 40s decided to plant hops, and we just can't contain them. They literally start to grow everywhere. We used to have three or four poles, now we have six, and they're just kind of going through everything. Yeah, we've had the local, local brewer, brew beer. Yep, we have, yeah. and he made an actual like 18th century type of beer. It was pretty uh, thick, it was more like a stout, but it was pretty good. It was kind of nice to see something that we grew yeah. uh, made into something. Yep, cool. All right. Want to head over to the meeting house? Sure. So this meeting house obviously is not the meeting house. It's not. So in the 1980s, they wanted to do, uh, there was a movie company that wanted to do a series about Rebecca Nurse and her two sisters. And it was called Three Sovereigns for Sarah. And they were scouting the area for locations. Obviously, it made sense to film here because Rebecca lived here. Um, but they wanted a place to have the courthouse, uh, which would have been their meeting house. And so they asked if they could build it here on site. They used a lot of information from records of the time to recreate as accurately as possible. And when they were done filming it, they actually sold it to us for a dollar because they didn't want to have to tear it down. Nice. So it would be cost too much to tear down than it would be. It probably would have, yeah. It's a great asset for us because it really helps bring the story about the witch trials because you can kind of see like where the first examinations, like including Rebecca's, would have been at the Salem Village Meeting House in Danvers here. And of course, this was all researched, so sort of the, the dimensions and some of the interior and stuff like that was all based on research that was done? Yep. Nice shiny new lock. <laughs> It's a beautiful space. It was built for sound um, for movies, so it's pretty echoey, but it really holds, you can hear anything anyone says from anywhere in the building. One of the things that they did change, while they did try to keep as historically accurate as possible, the floor is actually cement. Um, it cost too much to do a wooden floor, so it was cement, and they had an artist come in and paint the floor to look like wood. And you can start to see in some of the sections where it's starting to wear away. But for years, people didn't believe us um, that it was actually cement. And we actually um, have the the, uh, the altar table here is on a platform. When this was um, the meeting house, they would only bring out the altar table when they were doing the Lord's Supper, which was about once a month. Um, so it wouldn't have been here all the time. We keep it here because we don't have anywhere else to put it. But it shows you what the meeting house would have looked like during church. And then the meeting house could be changed over and turned into a courthouse. It could also be turned into a place to have town meetings. So it was a multi-purpose building. So you will see that there's no real religious symbolry used in here because that's not how the Puritans really um, 
did church. <laughs> so, you know, you won't see anything that looks, you know, you see the pulpit, but other than that, it could just be a multi-purpose building. And I see a sounding board. Yep, the sounding board is for the minister. The minister would stand below it, and the sounding board would help project his voice. Sweet. We also would have had pews filling the whole building to keep uh, warmth, um, especially in the winter months because, as you notice, there's no fireplace. But we removed a lot of them because, again, they were built for a movie and they were not built to last. So we bring benches in, uh, which makes it easier for visitors to sit. And if they wanted to sit in here, we want to do a presentation. Very good. Very nice. All right. Where to? Where do you want to go next? Well, maybe, I guess we could just take a quick look, so I'll just show the two, uh, two fields. Sure. Well, actually, will you want to do the barn? Yeah. Let's do the barn. Now, th again, this is, the this is not the original barn either. No, so our original barn, from what I've heard, burned down in about the 60s, and they were trying to raise enough money to build something comparable and new. And there was a historic house that was slated for demolition in the 70s. And members of our organization actually went and salvaged it. And a lot of the wood was actually just stored here on site for about 10 years when they decided that they would refashion the um, historic house as a barn. And I'll show you when we go inside a picture of what the uh, house would have looked like that we tore down. As you can see, we use it as our gift shop today. But we have a great picture of the house. Um, and this is how it looked in 1910. And it was right in the middle of where they wanted to build a shopping plaza. And so the members of our group pulled down the left portion of the house, which was the oldest, which dated back to the 1670s, and rebuilt it here. And you can see where they used some of the original pieces and what's been replaced. So they did use a good portion of the house. And they were able to take it down so easily because it's a post and beam construction. So you can see that the house is really held together by pegs. They didn't use a lot of nails. So you knock the pegs out, and everything falls apart like puzzle pieces. And you can put it back together pretty easily. We also left the wall over here open, so you could see how a wall would have been fashioned. The thin strips of wood called lathing, and over the lath plaster, and a whitewash. We also have some neat artifacts from the uh, witch trials time period. So these panes of glass were actually found at the site of the Salem Village Parsonage. That's where Reverend Paris lived and where the witch trials really started in his house. Yeah. Um, and those were found during archaeological dig, and we have them in here to look at, which is really neat. Nice. All right, so we get, we don't have to go into them, we get two out, out we call them outbuildings, right? We have two, yeah, two smaller outbuildings that, um, we're not sure when the dairy shed came up, but in lots of pictures from the 1800s, it actually sat over the well, and that was to keep the water in the well from freezing um, in the winter, but it also kept dairy products cool. So if you had milk or cheese and you didn't want it to spoil, you could lower them in jars into the water, and the building kept everything pretty um, pretty cool. And then they moved it over here um, because the well dried up, and so we use it as an office space today, but the well would have actually been right where that... Yeah, I've never seen postcards, and you see the postcards in this building is really close, to, much closer to the house, yeah. Yep. And then the smaller one is a shoe shop, which I've heard varying stories about where it came from, but some people said it was on the property just further back in the woods. Some people have said that it was brought from another place, but it's a little cobbler and shoe shop. Um, basically, you could have these little structures all throughout the village, and then traveling cobblers could come and actually work on shoes and then move on from place to place. They would basically rent um, pieces of property to have these little shops so they could bounce around to different places. So people didn't come to them, they came to people. Nice. And then there's the backfield, and down there's the cemetery. And our backfield um, is actually, you can't see it right now because it's just been cut, but we actually grow alfalfa for a local dairy farm. It's a lot of work to maintain the grounds here, and we do have people that come in and actually cut a lot of the grass, but 
the back field and the front field are all grown with alfalfa and then the dairy farmer comes in, cuts it all down, wraps it up, lets it ferment and then feeds it to his cows. So we kind of have a bartering situation going on today where he doesn't have to pay to grow this anywhere. We give him the space and he maintains it. Right, we get, we get, we get the, uh, not the grass, but we get the uh, grounds cut. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice. Can you think of anything else? Can you think of anything? That's about yeah. it, huh? I think that's pretty much the, the main grounds of the house. And then, of course, we have a curator that, that, that lives on the other side of the we house. We do. Right? So we have well, on-site caretakers that live on the other portion. On-site caretaker, that's right. And then we have a, they have a living room and a bedroom. And then the back portion here was a kitchen that was added on the 20s um, that they have as well. So they do have electricity. They do have running water, if you're concerned. Um, I'm not. Very different <laughs> from the other side of the house, which doesn't have any of that. So future videos, we'll come into each of these rooms and stuff, each of these buildings. Right, and we'll we'll give everyone a uh, a more detailed look at everything. But right now, thank you. It's a nice little overview of the whole property. Yeah, and thank you. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out. Maybe we'll show the front field on the way out. And, All right, uh, thank you for visiting. Bye. Well, that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to our channel and like this video, and check us out at patreoncom forward slash RNH. As always, we couldn't do this without your continued support. See you next time.